Timothy J. Redman received his PhD in political science from the University of Buffalo. He's an award-winning educator and author of over 100 articles on critical thinking and politics and the book Political Tribalism in America, How Hyperpartisanship Dumbs Down Democracy and How to Fix It. He teaches political science and history at Williamsville East High School and Damon University, respectively. And maybe most importantly, he plays drums for the hardcore punk rock band, Snapcase. During our chat, we talked about the origins of tribalism, from our early religious wars to William Golding's book, Lord of the Flies, and how this very human characteristics of tribal behavior has caused modern-day Democrats and Republicans to have an unfavorable opinion of the opposing party almost 90% of the time. We then got a bit wonky while discussing the importance of placing party over policy, how we can better acquire and evaluate false political information, decipher political polls and complex statistics, and how best to navigate the stream of phony headlines and fake stories from partisan players on both sides of the aisle. We even ended our discussion with the story of Oresteia, a collection of plays that illustrates the tragedy of tribalism and revenge, as only a Greek tale can. It was my pleasure to have Professor Redman on my show, and I hope you learned as much as I did from it. Well, there we are, Tim Redman. Thank you for joining me on True 30 this morning. Really happy to have you. Hi, Joey. Hi, thanks. I'm uh, really excited to be here. I do need to mention that you were the first intellectual to reach out to me uh, about coming on the podcast. And as we just talked about off camera, it was due to our interview with uh, Hiram Lewis on his book, uh, The Left and the Right, uh, The Myth of the Left and the Right, which... Uh, when you when I when you did reach out, I thought that might have been the book. So <laughs> that seems appropriate. Yeah, I was uh, I you know I recently came upon that book and read it, and um, it just it was in in my opinion such a wonderful book. And then so after I read it, I wanted more content, and and so then I started looking online for videos, and I came upon your podcast, and it was a really great interview. Yeah. And uh, so yeah, so that's why I reached out. So thank you for uh, having me on. No problem. I also think that was neat for me is that some people are recognizing you being some of those people that you can actually engage in polite political yes. debate. Yeah. <laughs> and, and so hopefully that's helpful. And part of what you talk about, and for those on YouTube, this is the book from Ted Redmond, Tim Redman. It's called Political Tribalism in America, How Hyperpartisanship Dumbs Down Democracy and How to Fix It. And much like I shared with the authors of uh Hiram Lewis and his brother, who wrote this fantastic book, The Myth of the Left and the Right, is that it was very well resourced, very well cited, and very well written. So I appreciate that because it's a very cogent 175 page that thinks about what it is. And uh, I have lots to ask you about. So in the preface, you actually talk specifically about an Annenberg Public Policy Center that found 26% of Americans were able to identify were unable to identify the three branches of government as the legislative, the executive, and the judicial. Not a huge surprise. 0.01% of Americans knew that the five freedoms guaranteed by the First Amendment of the U.S. Constitution encapsulate religion, speech, press, petition, and assembly. But the piece that got me actually laughing out loud was even more troubling is the fact that some 20% of those surveyed agreed that the First Amendment guaranteed the right to own a pet <laughs> and to drive a car. So, yeah, I was like, OK, yeah, here we go. Very, very heady debates at, at that constitutional <laughs> convention. And, uh, well, the, the Bill of Rights was written afterwards. But, yeah. Oh. Man, and I think that the, the neat thing you dove quickly into, and we can start here probably, is the folk theory versus the tribal theory. And I think this was really cool because it framed the discussion very well. So let me help you here. The, the folk theory is that citizens should objectively acquire, perceive, and evaluate information, use that information to inform their political opinions, and allow these considered views to influence their decisions upon which political party to support. The tribal theory is a mere image of the ideal in which the first and foremost identify with the political party and then proceed to uncritically adopt the party's opinions while subjectively processing information in a manner that is favorable to their party's views and allegiances. And I think that is where we are today, no? <laughs> we are yeah, all tribal. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I think so. And, um, you know, it was, it's interesting, related to your first point, uh, there's been a lot of books written about the lack of knowledge that Americans have, a lot of Americans have about American politics. Mm -hmm. This is a different book. This isn't, um, as I say in the preface, it's not about what we 
know about politics, it's how we think about politics. And, and I think that's even a more pertinent and important question to explore. Because it's, you know, some of those questions, I, I am troubled by the fact that, you know, 20% think the First Amendment deals with owning a car, having a pet. But like a lot of those things are, you know, they could be gotcha questions on a, in a lot of those books or they're, you know, do you know who is the secretary of state at this time or the, you know, right. whatever, undersecretary of this at that time. And, you know, I mean, Americans, a lot of Americans won't have that information at the ready. But whenever we do think about politics and we and we all should think about politics or we often think about politics, our thinking can be derailed. Uh, by what I'm calling this uh, tribal theory of democracy. And that, I think, is the larger issue, because if you don't know a particular fact, an obscure fact, you can always look it up. But how our thinking about politics, that that is a lot harder to understand, to even acknowledge, um, and then overcome. Yeah. And so that's what I was really trying to do with the book is to raise awareness. There's so much great research out there done by so many incredible political scientists and psychologists. And I really wanted to try to bring that research uh, together because there really hadn't been a book that sort of compiled all of this information in one place. And then I, I sort of wanted to lay out that research as generally as the thinking process goes. And so as as you laid out, we have our party attachments and, you know, we, we could talk about where those come from if you'd like, but we, that's sort of where we start. And we start with our party attachments. And then unfortunately that really derails everything that, that comes after it. It, it derails how we search for information. It derails how we even remember information and perceive information. It derails how we evaluate information. And, uh, that is problematic because it really, it, ideally, it should go the other way around. Um, and as you said, we've just completely flipped it on its head. Yeah, and you do a really good job in the opening chapter, which is called The Nature of Political Tribalism. Do you want to talk a little bit about the study that you talked? It was Muzaffar Sheriff, who in the summer of 1954 conducted a study with, well, why don't you go ahead and talk about these young men and, and what happened with their camp in Oklahoma City, because it was a fascinating story. Yeah, so this was, uh, you know, it was a study that was done um, with basically a, a lot of times it's equated to almost a Lord of the Flies sort of thing. So they they brought in these, they were all middle class, white, uh, Christian kids around the same age. And they they brought them into with two different cohorts uh, to this camp. And they each side didn't know the, the, that the other camp was there. So they were sort of on different sides of the park. And I, I think they let it go for may, maybe a couple of days or a week or so. And these different groups, they sort of, they developed their own mores, their own norms, their own way of speaking. Uh, they, they came up with names for their groups. The one was the Rattlers, the other was the Eagles. And they, uh, and they even developed flags for their groups and, and so on. And then the researchers let each of the groups realize that there was another group there. And immediately they were sort of very territorial and talking, talked about like sort of running this other group off of, off of the campgrounds and so on. And then, you know, the researchers were trying to poke and prod these kids to, to have some conflict. So they brought the two camps together and then they had all kinds of competitive games, tug of wars and, you know, baseball games and things like that. And sure enough, they, they started to turn against each other. Um, and it progressively got worse until fistfights started breaking out. And the whole notion of that is, and then this, this led to some other research, uh, where basically it was looking into, okay, what, what divides us and what, you know, what do you actually need to sort of turn one group of people against another group of people? And what this research shows is not that much Th this one you know, was you actively had them trying to sort of antagonize these two different groups. But uh, Henry Tajfel, who did some later research on this, he would just do things like bring bring people into the lab and flip a coin. And, you you know, if you got a heads, you were in this group. If you had a tail, you were in this group. 
And the people knew this. They, they knew that they were completely randomly assigned to one of these groups. They didn't know anyone else in their in group or know anyone in the out group. And then they have them play, you know, these sort of economic games. W- would you share money with someone in your in group? Would you share some money with someone in the out group? And they, and they found that instantly these people became competitive and they saw the world sort of in this us and them lens. And he sort of drew the conclusion that it really doesn't take anything. <laughs> Uh, much at all to get us to to sort of have this tribal mentality where we we have our group and we tend to think positive things about our group and then there's the out group and we tend to think negative things about that group and and that can lead to a whole host of uh horrible things as as we've seen throughout history and that as we're starting to see unfold in American politics but it's pretty easy to create these group tensions and then when you have something like politics, which can be pretty contentious and rightly so, and people have strong opinions about things and rightly so, uh, that, that it can get pretty toxic pretty quickly. Right. And that's kind of where we are today. And it's funny you mentioned the Lord of the Flies. because it's the first thing I thought about when I read the yeah. passage. And I was like, oh, so I looked it up and well, Lord of the Flies was published in 1954, the same year. <laughs> this book was published. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, wow, okay. So yeah, they were onto something in 1954 specific to tribalism. And, you know, you also shared some history, which I think is important to share with the listeners here that speaks to this throughout the ages. It's that if you look at the us versus them, the re- those are the religious wars. I grew up as a Catholic, so I know exactly what was going on there specific to um, the Catholics and the Protestants and the 30 year war and all of that. But you also talk about the Crusades. You talk about the late 1400s to the late 1800s. Merchants from various Arab and European countries sold tens of millions of Africans into slavery. And in 1915, Turkish nationalists murdered over a million Armenians in their quest to build a union that would include people of proven Turkic origin. So if you look at that, and to your point earlier, 88% of Democrats and 91% of Republicans recently admitted that they have an unfavorable view of the opposing party. So we're there. Right. And 75 percent of Democrats believe that the GOP is closed minded. <laughs> so and then one thing with GOP, because I've obviously spending most of my time in politics now, I like to, de- to delineate the difference between the elected GOP and the GOP, because it's one of those things where I have so many friends that I would say are small conservatives, small C conservatives. I have some friends, relatives and buddies from high school that are full blown uh, supporters of Donald Trump. And I still love them. We get, we, 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 we have lots of debates, but it's one of those things where I would say, you know, and we can talk about this later based on bias. I, it is difficult to say that either party isn't entrenched in what their beliefs are, right? They kind of sit back and the GOP, we're going to say the GOP, if you're on the left is, is closed minded. And then my friends on the right will say the same thing about us, right? So that's the partisan discrimination you talk about, you know, in chapter one. Yeah. So it's interesting because one of the other, um, so I have my, my PhD is in political science. So I've always been interested in politics and, uh, but I'm also really interested in critical thinking. So that's this, this book is sort of like the nexus or interconnection between those two topics. But my third real area of passion is, uh, human rights and the study of genocide and, Mm -hmm. and, you know, there's, I included a lot of that sort of history, uh, in that chapter because, uh, not to say that, that we are completely there yet and not, not to say that, you know, we're, we're going to have that unfold in American politics, but, uh, the, to just sort of try to drive home the point that this tribalism stuff is serious, uh, and it, and it needs to be studied and discussed and addressed, uh, because all of those steps that I kind of lay out in that chapter, I talk about uh, wanting to segregate yourself from other people, wanting to discriminate against other people, want, uh, dehumanizing other people. All of those are, you know, these steps that that lead to these horrific human rights abuses. And I lay out some of the research that shows that that's happening in American politics. Again, not that this isn't a slippery slope argument that we're necessarily going to slide down to the road of major human rights violations and genocide, 
but it is painting the picture that you know we are moving in that direction and ever, ever so slightly whatever it is uh but all of those sort of road marks um are there and so you do see that you see democrats and republicans not wanting to live near one another not wanting to associate with one another as you were saying you know you have cross party friendships that's becoming less and less common um you have democrats and republicans who are willing to discriminate against another person simply because uh of their party and um dehumanization is becoming more common where democrats and republicans are uh less likely to recognize the full humanity of the other party and there there was a interesting study that just came out that i just read recently uh, that wasn't out by the time that i had published the book but you know the 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 trolley dilemma uh i don't know if you've ever read about this it's, it's like kind of in philosophy and there's this idea that there's a trolley running down a track and there's five people that are tied to the track mm -hmm. uh and then there's a side track with only one person that is tied to the track and you're standing next to the track and there's this switch and you could pull the switch if you decide not to pull the switch and and the train the trolley goes straight forward it runs over and kills those five people but if you pull the switch it will divert the train and it goes off to the side track and it kills one person and so this has always been sort of they've asked people what would you do and overwhelmingly it's like over over 90% of people say well i i would pull the switch and it's the hey classic utilitarian I, i'm going to kill one to save five right mm -hmm. uh and so they recently did this with politics and they you know they asked democrats and republicans what would you do and again over 90% of democrats and 90% of republicans say well i i pull the switch it's tragic that this one person's going to die but we save these five people so it's this classic moral dilemma but then what they did was they uh you know they changed the the party and <laughs> they told you what the uh, party identification was that's not good and uh so you know well now it's five republicans who are tied right. to the track and the one person over here is a democrat or vice versa and for both parties it it went from about 90% to 60% so a majority Oof. was still willing to like pull the switch to kill one to save five but you know you had that 30% of folks in each party who were like no I'm not going to pull this I'll save this democrat over here and let those five republicans die or vice versa and so you start to see that and Lily Mason has done a lot of re uh Nathan Kamal has done a lot of research in this where they've talked about political violence and done surveys on this sort of thing and you do have to be careful because a lot of times you can ask people you know do you do you wish that something bad happened to members of the other party and and they might just be Yes, of course I do blowing off steam or something like that. But they were really careful. They they would follow up with do you, are you really really sure? Are you do you really mean this or are you just saying this? And still a, a significant, you know, they're not huge percentages, but uh still a, a sizable percentage of people would say yes, I I want to inflict damage on on these folks and or I'm going to take pleasure uh in watching these people suffer. And that's that's dangerous territory. And you're talking about tens of thousands of Americans who hold these views, and uh, that that's troubling territory for sure. It is, and you actually referenced that from the beginning. So George Washington, before he was president, specific to the Puritans, Cotton Mather, and George Washington respectively wrote that Native Americans were ravenous, howling wolves and beasts of prey. And then how Nazi uh, Heinrich Himmler referred to Jewish people as bacillus that needed to be destroyed. And so those are examples of that. And the 30% marker, to your earlier point, doesn't surprise me if it was in jest, but the fact that they followed up mm. and they continued to stay in there and that cemented belief is pretty pretty troubling. And that actually, you, you did a good job of also bringing that to the fore, how this came to be today in our politics, or Harry Reid described Donald Trump as a Frankenstein's monster, New York Magazine itself, which I subscribe to, depicted Donald Trump as a pig on its cover, and I remember that. And then Fox News commentator uh, Janine Pirro described Democrats as demon rats. So mm -hmm. if you look at, we are seeing this in our political culture today more and more, and I think that's, you know, that's obviously troubling. But what you did, I thought was really neat within the chapter, is that for us to heal on this front, 
we need to recognize our role in it. And then you quoted Richard Feynman. It says, the first principle is that you must not fool yourself. And you are the easiest person to fool, which is great because I can fool myself with rationale all day long. And then you gave some wonderful examples. Does your breathing speed up or your heart beat faster when someone criticizes your political party? When a political scandal erupts, do you feel deflated when it's our party or your party and relief and righteous indignation when it's not? And do you take pleasure in the politics failures of the other party, irrespective of the real world implications? And I can't tell you, 10 years ago, I would have answered differently on all of those fronts. Um, As a pretty entrenched liberal most of my life, I live in San Francisco. I've worked in San Francisco, New York City most of my career. I worked in media. So most of my colleagues were left, left center, sometimes right center, but rarely were they, you know, on the the extremes of any political body. And I would have answered those questions differently. Uh, than I do today. And I think reporting on politics for the last couple of years has also changed my view of the world. It's specific to what we'll get into later, which is kind of diving in, doing some lateral reading, understanding what you're trying to understand, mm-hmm. as opposed to trying to confirm, you know, your own beliefs. And I think that's that's really what's neat. And then you specifically talked about one remedy is that you can also focus on what unites us versus what divides us. Why don't you talk a little bit about that? Because I thought that was really, really clever. Right. And I I hope we do, because I'd love to hear more on why you think that that process, because that that fascinates me. So I'm always very interested. And so I I hope we can come back to that. Oh, sure. You can you can share a little bit about that. But uh, so this the another really fascinating thing about this divide um, that we have in the country now, a lot of it political scientists uh, refer to it as false polarization. Uh, and we can get into it because there's, I think there's a lot of confusion about the polarization issue because there's different kinds of polarization. And some of it is definitely happening. And some of it, there's a debate about whether or not it's happening. I, I kind of fall on the side that it's not quite happening. So there's policy polarization is this idea that our issue positions are separating. And uh, again, there is a strong debate about this in political science, but yes, there's, there <laughs> in, in my opinion, there's a lot of evidence that we're not nearly as divided as we think we are on issues. Now, there's something called affective polarization, which is how we feel about the other party. And that has grown tremendously over the last couple of decades. And that's measured, they ask you on a thermometer scale, like on zero to a hundred degrees, how do you feel about your party and members of the other party? And generally people give about a 70 degree score for their party, which is they feel very warmly about members of their own party. Mm -hmm. For the opposition party, it used to be like just above 40, between 40, 50 degrees. And now it's actually below like 20 degrees. So it's not so much that we feel better about our own party or members of our own party, but what's happened is how we feel about members of the opposition party has plunged. And that's where you get, that's why it just feels different now. And there's a lot of anger and vitriol and hatred for the other side. But the the fascinating thing about this is sort of like we hate each other, but we don't really know why we hate each other. And we think it's because uh, everyone on the other side is an extremist, right? Everybody has these very, very extreme views. And that's why they're so far away from me and what I believe. And that's why we're so different. But when you actually look at a lot of issue positions, a lot of Americans are very moderate. Uh, they're in the middle or they're just to the left and just to the right. But when you ask Democrats and Republicans, and I do this with my students all the time, and it's a, it's a or anytime I do like public talks, because it's a fascinating exercise. Uh, you just, you ask them, okay, what I've got, you know, a list of just pulled from different studies, a list of issue positions, or, you know, what, what percentage of Democrats or Republicans do you think agree with this particular statement? Uh, and people are way off, right? I mean, liberals think, or Democrats think that, uh, Republicans are way, way more conservative than they actually are. And Republicans think that liberals are way, way more, or Democrats are way, way more liberal than they are. And we just vastly overestimate how extreme members of the other party are. 
And it's not only on issue positions, we also do this with like demographics. So one of the things I do, I do talk about in the book is how, and this goes to Lily Mason's research too. She talks about how parties are sort of becoming these mega identities where, you know, the, the parties are sort of sorting by race, by religion or no religion, uh, by, you know, do you live in an urban area or a rural area and so on. And then that has been happening, but we vastly overestimate how much that's happened or what, what these, you know, uh, sort of what c- kind of characteristics or demographics, uh, make up the other party. And so, for example, Democrats vastly overestimate how many Republicans are rich or how many Republicans are old, where Republicans vastly overestimate how many Democrats are gay, how many Democrats, you know, belong in a union, how many Democrats are atheists. So we sort of have these images in our head of what the typical Republican is or the typical Democrat is. And for the most part, whether or not we think about like that, how they look or how they worship or what their issue positions are, we're vastly off. And that helps fuel a lot of this hatred and anger because they've, they've sort of done studies as well where they ask people, all right, you know, what do you think about the average Democrat or average Republican? And then they tell people the actual numbers afterwards and people realize <laughs> how off yeah. they were. Yeah. And then when they come to that realization, then they ask them, you know, they sort of do a pretest and post-test, post-test about that thermometer scale reading and people's anger and hatred towards the other party goes down because they don't seem so different. They don't seem so alien and they don't seem so hostile. Uh, and so that I, I think it's important that we actually have a realistic view of what members of the other party are like. And it's even for members of our own party, because they find that Democrats tend to think that their own party is much more liberal and homogenous than it really is. And Republicans do the same thing. And so we don't even know members of our own party. And it's also helps to realize that, oh, not every Democrat you know, there's there are pro-life Democrats and there are pro-choice Republicans. And when you learn that, mo- most people are like, really, there, there can't be or uh, it's it's quite shocking. You know, when I when I do these numbers with with my students and they're they're just way off uh, and then it it just it gives you a different perspective and it sort of turns down that temperature. It does. And the optics you mentioned are really funny because even per- even your how you dress makes a difference. So I have about 15 percent of my audience is in Britain. And I get a lot of wonderful comments from mostly females, which is my audience over there, about being polite. They like Mm -hmm. the fact that I have polite debates. Even when I disagree with the people I bring on, I don't attempt to gotcha them and I'm not trying to be mean spirited or dunk on them or whatever the, you know, descriptor is. But the reason I mention that is that they say things like, you're my favorite conservative. I wish we had conservatives like you here in Britain. (laughs) I was like, (laughs) oh, cool. And I, you know, I don't take any issue with that because the Labor Party and the Tory Party is much different than it is here as far as the polarization. Right. But I mention that because it is an optics thing. And then I think what was a neat story in your in your book was about Watertown, New York. Yeah. What did what are they doing as a town <laughs> that we need to emulate? I mean, and number one, how big are they? Like how many people are in Watertown? Actually, why don't you just tell the audience what Watertown is and what it's about? Because that was a really cool piece. Yeah. So this was uh it was, you know, there, well, there's been a lot of talk about all this polarization and, and, uh, there was a study that was done on Watertown, New York. And, um, I'm not, I'm not sure how, how big it is, but the, for whatever reason, you know, they found that this is one of the places where they were, when they were doing all these surveys and asking people how they feel about members of the other party, that polarization hadn't seemed to take root yet. And, or at least it wasn't as bad as in other parts of the country. And yeah. so they, they were interested in this and they, you know, sent a reporter there to sort of dig into this and figure out why. And most of it came down to, uh, that it was just, it was still, uh, an integrated community. You know, there were still Republicans and Democrats living next to each other. They were friends. They worked together. They were neighbors. They talked to each other. And uh, because of that, because there were these personal relationships and personal connections, you didn't have 
some of that hatred seep in. Now, they did talk about how, you know, they're not immune to these national trends. It is happening. Uh, and they did talk about some stories where, you know, you had some of this vitriol sort of sprouting up. But it was fascinating because they have like, you know, that the head of the local pro-life organization and the head of the local pro-choice organization and their friends. And they, yeah. and they say, well, we disagree vehemently on this issue, but I also know that they're, they're a good friend of mine and they're a great person. And, you know, we just have a disagreement on this and they still have that disagreement, but it's, they're able to live together and they're, they're able to look past that and agree to disagree. Uh, and so it, it was this unique sort of community in that sense. I'm, and I'm sure there are other ones like it, you know, around the country, but that, you know, we, we could be losing that because, um, I think as more of our community kind of goes online and then we sort of separate, it's easier to separate online. Uh, it, it becomes worse. And, well, you're um, autonomous too. I think that's another piece yeah. of it is that what you talked about specific to your chapter's point was that if we have more in common than we have, than that divides us. And I think that's really key. And part of like the ethos here within True 30, when I joined this, I have libertarians and conservative writers and thinkers on our editorial board. And we did that on purpose. And part of which is we have really fun debates back and forth. Right. And we've always thought that, you know, the old, this let's agree to disagree is, is a, it's useful, but I think it's even more useful to say, let's first seek to understand. Because mm -hmm. if you can understand someone without agreement, you can still like them. It right. doesn't matter. You know, for, for me, you know, where I sit and I always have on the abortion issue, it's, it's one of those things. It's a, it's a clash of absolutes. So if you are a religious person, which my mom is, and she's Mexican and she grew up Catholic, there's no, you're never going to alter my mom's view on that. <laughs> and so she'll say things like, well, your party murders babies. And I'm like, well, okay, let's just be clear, mommy. I love you, but we are actually not murdering <laughs> babies. And it's, and this is from a really, you know, pious, wonderful human being. So mm -hmm. you look at that and you're like, wow. And then our side, obviously on the liberal side is that it's a, it's an, it's an autonomy and privacy issue with an adult human female. Like what does she get to do with her body? And, and if you can actually understand that, which most of my friends and I do, we don't have vitriol because it's right. just, that's where it is. I, mm -hmm. I actually side with the adult human female. They decide with religion or their own personal beliefs. Neither's bad. I mean, mm. it on its face, but how it goes about it, I think is really key. And so, yeah, to close that loop, I think that was great that you talked about, because I believe it, and we can talk about that later as far as like my own shift, which we'll yeah. get into later, was because of that. I think because I grew up poor and I grew up with a single mom and I have a lot of friends from high school that are artisans and electricians and carpenters and construction workers versus the people I actually you know, worked with for the last 25 years of my life, which were kids from some of the best schools in the country, prep school, right. wealth, things that I didn't have. You know, I didn't even understand how to relate to these folks when I got into this world. And so those are the kind of things where I think we're still polarized on, on many different fronts. Uh, chapter two, you kind of move into placing party before policy, which I thought was great. And you gave a wonderful example, which I don't think most people <laughs> on my party recognize, is that between 2005 and 2015, multiple polls showed that 50% of Democrats and 60 to 70% of Republicans supported building a barrier along the Mexican border, mm. including Bernie and a couple other folks. So if you look <laughs> at that, and you know, it's that's a really stark number. And then by 2019, the Democratic support for the wall plunged to 6% while Republicans right. surged to 82%. And that's a perfect example of policy not having anything to do <laughs> with your vote, right? I mean, that, yep. that's an example for me. And I, I'll you know, admit this, anything Donald Trump said, you know, even as someone who's center, I, I just, I doubt him instantly. Mm -hmm. So I don't like yeah. what he says. And he's, I'm gonna build this wall. I'm like, well, no, you're not. And you're a knucklehead and <laughs> it's not gonna work. But Let's talk a little bit about that because that's a great example of what we're doing specific to our body politic is that yeah. we are choosing party over policy. Yeah, so the, you know, going back to the, the tribal theory, the idea is that we have our party attachments and then we 
simply look at what our party is saying. It could be party leaders, it could be our friends or whatever. And we simply say, okay, what do we believe about this? Essentially is what we do. It doesn't feel like that, which makes this really, really hard to overcome because it feels like we're thinking we might be talking with a group of friends. We might be listening to the president speak on the news. We might be reading an article about some new issue that crops up. But uh, because of those attachments, you know, like you were saying, if Donald Trump is for it, then I'm against it. If I'm, you know, I'm reading uh, and or if I'm a Republican and Donald Trump is for it, then I'm for it. And there's and we don't think independently through that issue, study that issue, the pros and cons of that issue. And so that's I mean, I mean, it's just there's so many examples of this where uh, you and, and Trump was actually wonderful for this because he had a lot of liberal positions on different issues or or took a stance on both sides of an issue at various times, you know, either before he was running for president and then after or so on. And so you could just tell people, hey, Trump is for this. What do you think? And, you know, Democrats, oh, it's a terrible idea. Republicans, it's a great idea. And then you you say Trump believed the opposite. And then it just the parties flip. Right. Yep. And and so we just we tow the party line. And they, there was another um, study, I think his last name is Macy, but he did a thing where uh, he had all these sort of worlds. They were online worlds. And he, he had a bunch of issues that hadn't really become politicized yet. And then they, so you had Democrats and Republicans and all of these, I, I don't know if he did, you know, 10 or 20 different sort of worlds. And then he introduced these issues. And then he asked, you know, people like, what's your position on this? And what he found was it was completely random. In some issues, let's say whatever the issue, issue X. In some of these worlds, the Democrats supported X. In other worlds, the Republicans supported X. And what he found was what he called the early movers. So it was like if if uh, in this particular world, one of the, a Democrat chimed in first and was like, oh, this is a really good issue. Then all the other Democrats in the groups were like, yes, this is a good issue. And all the Republicans were like, it's a terrible issue. But in this other world, right, a Republican just happened to be the first person to jump in and say, hey, this is a really good issue. Republicans followed suit and Democrats said the opposite. And that's kind of what we do. And there have been a bunch of studies that have shown this. My my favorite example of this is that I share in the book is one that they did with uh, welfare programs. And I mean, you couldn't the the one welfare program is like super super generous. I, I lay out all the the provisions, but it was like free two year college and this much money a month and free food whatever. And then there was this really really stringent welfare policy. And you know if we were like we were talking about Hiram Lewis and and his book, uh, if we were ideological and we were sort of committed to this principle, uh, you know, Democrats would have said, I support the, you know, the very generous welfare bill. And Republicans would have said, I, I'm opposed to the generous and I support the more stringent. But what they found was that when you just, you said at the top, before you give this list, you say, this is the Republican proposal. Mm-hmm. And it's the super, super generous welfare bill. Republicans support it and Democrats hate it and vice versa. Right. I mean, so you have this crazy situation where Democrats are looking at, you know, it says Republicans support universal health care, Republicans support, uh, you know, free college. And Democrats are saying, no, that's a terrible idea. Right. And that goes against everything we think the parties stand for. And vice versa, you know, have Republicans saying, yes, universal health care. Yes, we should have, you know, free college. (laughs) And it's just because people are looking at the party queue and they're like, oh, that's what my party stands for. Then that's what I believe. And it's we we don't even really pay attention to the to the policy itself. Uh, And, you know, that what I what I try to lay out in the book is why that's damaging to a democratic society, because ideally we're supposed to sort of vote policy. Right. And we're electing people into office. We look at these policies and we say, I think these would be good policies and I'm going to elect people who are going to you know pass and implement these policies but that's how it's supposed to work. But that's not what we're doing. We're just voting for a party, um, even even if we are personally opposed to the policies that those parties are ultimately going to be pursuing. And that's that's not democracy. It's not representative government. Um, no. and, and I also say it's not, you know, self-government in, in the 
in the idea that, you know, we think of self-government as sort of this concept of where we, the people, elect our leaders and they pass laws and so on. But self-government is also about governing ourselves, governing our passions, our tribal passions, um, overcoming these biases that, that we have to just support the party no matter what. And, and if we're not doing that, we're not a self-governed people. No, and you did a great job of, of sharing Garrett, uh, Garrett Hardin's essay on the tragedy of the commons. And that, you know, for those who don't know, that it's an old tale around cattle herders. And so if you say to the cattle herder, hey, you know, on your own, you can do whatever you want. They're sensibly going to add cattle to a grazed pasture that they're sharing with other <laughs> cattle herders. And if they all continue to add horse or cows, eventually none of them will have anything to herd. None of them have anything to graze on. All the cattle dies. <laughs> Everyone's ruined, right? And I think that that is a piece that talks to you. You also mentioned um, how we kind of affiliate things specifically to identify our politics. So if, as an example, I just put a list together here, the things that I've actually covered in my reporting over the last two years is everything from BLM, because if you identify as BLM, at your home or on your car, everyone's going to assume you are on the left. And if you, you know, trans rights on the left, climate change on the left, gun rights on the right, abortion is illegal, should be illegal on the right, you know, racism, a left, because everyone that's, so it's, it's immediate. You can actually mm -hmm. see it and you can see it within Facebook posts. You know, my right. friends on the left, will have the BLM hand sticking mm -hmm. up. They'll have the let's fight for Ukraine. Let's fight for abortion rights. It's it doesn't in its identity. It's right. a big piece of where it is today. And I think that is where the emotion rides strong. And there's a I'm sure you studied Dr. Jonathan Haidt mm -hmm. in your homework. And he's someone that I talk about quite often and I'm a big fan of. I belong to the Heterodox Academy and I've read all of his Great. books. And he wrote a book in 2011 that talks to this, and it was called the the Righteous Mind, Why Good People Are Divided by Religion and Politics. And he uses a, a an analogy that the elephant itself is the emotion that we dictate uh, and that we deal with in our body politic, and that the logic and reason is the rider, which, you know, for me, if Donald Trump says something, my emotion veers left. <laughs> and so the emotion has already done this. And then the rider is the post hoc argument about why I did it. <laughs> well, I don't, because everything he says is wrong. And, you know, and obviously I, I don't believe everything he says is wrong, to be clear. But it's it is an emotional piece that I have to then dial back and mm -hmm. figure out, OK, OK, let me look into it because he's not wrong on everything. So it's it's very difficult. But then you actually talk about and you talk, you mentioned this earlier, the necessary component to our healing as a culture. And this is what scares me the most is that we need to critically think. And I don't see a lot of that happening and not because people aren't capable of doing it, but because it's very difficult when you work 10, 12 hours a day and you have kids and you have a life that you're completely immersed in and a policy comes up and for you to do your homework on that policy, you have to triangulate sources. You have mm -hmm. to read extensively on what it is specifically to overcome your own bias. And you mentioned in these four areas, which I thought was really uh well articulated is that citizens can refuse to think critically, which many of us do, and put policy before party, right? So you can just say, I'm not going to really look at it, but I looked at the policy. I think it's kind of cool. Um, citizens can think critically and then put policy before party. Citizens can refuse to think critically and put party before policy. And then citizens can think critically and put party before policy on that side. So the idea, obviously, is number two is the best if we can actually think critically and then put policy before our party, that would be the best scenario, correct? <laughs> With everything you laid out? Right, and yeah, so there's there's a lot of good points here and important points. Um, the, you know, as you said, this is this is not easy work. And, no. uh, and so I think, you know, the Democrat, the, the democratic ideal, the, the folk theory of democracy that we were, we've been talking about, is an ideal uh and yeah. it's probably one that is not achievable and th but that's okay the uh one of the major points that i tried to make is you know we are we are super busy people and we we can't all be these ideal democratic citizens who 
study every issue that comes up in you know excruciating detail. What I'm asking people to do is um, to try to do a little bit of that if you can, of course. Yeah. But if you can't, then let's stop pretending that we have, right? <laughs> right. And um, right. because I think we need a lot more humility in our politics. What what we have now is people who aren't studying the issues, but who are taking very strong uh, positions on those issues and arguing very passionately about those issues. And in reality, we know very little about those issues. Uh, and again, it sort of, it, it feels like we're thinking because we might be listening to news or we might be, you know, scrolling through Twitter or whatever. And it feels like we're thinking, but, but we're really not. I mean, we're just picking up sort of what our party is telling us or these talking points. And uh, there's the, a, a great study um, by Fernbach and Salman who they, uh, I share this little graphic of a bike and they didn't do this. this that was Rebecca Lawson, I think, but she, she had people in this, one of these initial studies that looked at this, she gave people an outline of a bicycle and, and asked people, you know, how, how confident do you feel about a bicycle? And, and, you know, a lot of people say, oh, I feel very confident about a bike and how it works. And, and then she said, okay, if you fill in the rest of this picture, right, draw the rest of the bike. And people had, a, they had to fill in the rest of the frame, the, the gears and the pedals. And, and people had a really hard time doing this. And it was kind of comical when you look at some of the pictures, you know, they have the chain <laughs> going to both and they're completely unoperational if you had this, but you wouldn't yeah. be able to turn. And, yeah. and after she did this, you know, people were like, oh, I, oh my goodness, I guess I really don't know how a bike works. And Fernbach and Slovman did, did this with politics. And so they asked people, you know, what is your opinion on, they had a host of issues, the Iran nuclear deal, flat tax, things like that. Cap and trade. Yeah. Cap and trade. And then they, uh, people had very strong opinions. And then, so they said, don't tell me your reasons for this. Cause that, we can all come up with reasons. It's like you were saying, you know, post hoc, right. Coming right. up with these reasons, these talking points, is it don't, don't tell me why you're for or against the flat tax. Just tell me how the flat tax works. Right. And people struggle with it. They, they really couldn't do that. And their point was, okay, how, how do you have such a strong opinion on something that you don't know very much about? And hopefully for most of us, when we realize that we might be a little bit humbled and we might recognize that we don't have all the information, we don't have the knowledge. So I am just parroting the party line. How can I have such a strong opinion on this issue if I haven't really studied it? And uh, that, I mean, if, if we can get a little bit more humility in our politics, I think it would go a long way to, again, lowering the temperature because it's, it's okay. To, I, I, I feel as though everybody feels like they have to have an opinion and it's got to be a strong opinion. Um, and like you said, you know, a lot of this virtue signaling, you know, we, we've got to go online and we've, we've got to express our, our, our opinion on this issue. Mm -hmm. It's okay to sort of say, oh, these issues are complicated. I really haven't had time to look into this. And I know that that goes against a lot of like, we're supposed to be active citizens and involved citizens and know all this stuff, but it's okay to, to just say, you know, I haven't really looked into it and I don't, I guess, have a really strong opinion on it. And if you get yeah, no. in a conversation, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, that's great. I was say, yeah, that's exactly it. Yeah. Yeah. And if you don't, uh, you know, uh, if you're getting in a conversation with someone and someone asks your opinion, it's okay. It's completely okay to say, I'm not really sure about that. Like, what do you think? And sort of, right. I want to understand where you're coming from. Like you were talking about have, trying to just gain understanding of where people are coming from. And we just, we don't do that. And I think it's important that we actually start doing that. And I would encourage people, of course, to go out and research these issues, all the pros and cons and all that sort of thing. But in lieu of that, I think our democracy would would really benefit from people just having some more humility. I agree. And I think that's where we can get into what I mentioned earlier, is that if you look at Number one, I actually did well on the bicycle test, which I thought was cool. <laughs> and it, it's because I, I I mountain bike. So, okay. you know, I know where, when the chain comes yeah. off. I know where it goes. <laughs> but yeah, it was a really cool test. So I think that what you talked about humility, 
There was a quote in here from an, Ale- from an essay on criticism from Alexander Pope, and it said, a little learning is a dangerous thing. Drink deep or taste not the Pyrian spring. Their shallow draughts intoxicate the brain and drinking largely sobers us again. And right. I mentioned that because it talks specifically to humility, which you just mentioned. And I think that's where I have fundamentally changed over the years. So as an example, I had a couple years ago, a buddy of mine, a black academic and DEI consultant. His name is Dax Devlin Ross. And he's a brilliant, just a brilliant man and a big heart and a, just a wonderful human being. He wrote a book called Letters to My White Male Friends. And it was all about white privilege and kind of where we come from as a culture. And it was, and it wasn't a, you know, combative piece. It wasn't, you know, like Imbram Kennedy's anti-racism approach, which is very polarized. It was much more, I think, balanced. So I had him on the show and we talked at length about his book and what it really meant to be anti-racist in a, in a I think, productive sense. And what he really wanted people like me to know, which is his white male friends. Here's what I went through. Here's the discrimination I suffered. Here's the discrimination I suffer currently. And it was a really neat conversation. And in prep of that, over the last three, four, five years of my life, as I shared with him, I became a stay-at-home dad about five years ago. My wife was an executive. And after COVID, it was one of those things where I just decided it was better served to do what I was doing in my media uh, to stay home. And I had a lot of time to read. So I read everything I'd get my hands on. James Baldwin, that's, you know, everything you could figure out. Um, and it was brilliant, wonderful prose, and it taught me a ton. Then I started to read books on the, from the intellectual class here currently. People like um, Thomas and Chatter Williams, uh, Glenn Lurie, John McHorder, Coleman Hughes, you know, just these black intellectuals that are talking about specifically what's happening today with racism and anti-racism, what all these things mean. And the reason that I, I wanted to let you know this is that I studying critical race theory as an example. I probably reported on that. I interviewed numerous people on camera and 50 or 60 people off about these topics. Teachers in, in school systems talking about intersectionality. Uh, academics about what critical race theory meant, you know, where Derek Bell and Richard Delgado and Kimberly Crenshaw and people of that ilk came from, where their the theory itself I thought was so powerful and educational and wonderful, but the strategy and how we're actually trying to apply it seemed really fraught with partisanship and identity politics, and it and it became really ugly. And it was one of those things where when I even had these discussions. On camera, I would get called a racist because I was pushing against, mm-hmm. I wasn't pushing against critical race theory. I was saying, yeah, I think it's great, as I just mentioned. Mm-hmm. But if I didn't say the right thing, I had progressive members of my, you know, my subscribers, like, unplug. Mm-hmm. And they're like, oh, how I thought you were different. And, you know, how dare you push back on this narrative? And I was like, I wasn't pushing back on the narrative that America had origins of racism and oppression. I was pushing back on, you know, that we need to, accept everything that these people are saying at face value without doing my homework. And the reason that I mentioned that homework piece, which talks to the essay of Alexander Pope, is the more homework you do, the more humble you become. Right. And that's really where it came for me, is everything I've researched, whether it's critical race theory, abolish the police, trans ideology, abortion, gun control, it doesn't matter what the subject is. If it's complex, it's complex. (laughs) Right. <laughs> it's like you need to peel it apart and you need to look back at, and you mentioned something later on in your book called lateral reading, which I thought was a great descriptor that I've never read before. And I'm going to use it. Um, I'll even attribute it to you, but it was one of those things where I was like, it's great because everything I do now, I have to go to both hmm. sides of any equation to read. I want to read a black intellectual who's pushing against DEI. I want to read a uh, a black intellectual on the left who was for DEI in every facet. And once you see those two things, you're like, oh, okay, this person's got a really good point. Oh, and this mm-hmm. person's got a good point. And then if you right. watch online debates of actual intellectuals, people mm-hmm. are not trying to dunk on one another. Right. You learn immediately that, oh shit, that's, yes. that was a good point. I didn't even think about mm-hmm. that. Oh Jesus, I'm wrong. Like I've been <laughs> wrong so many times that are like, oh man, I was dead wrong on this subject. Right. And, and mm-hmm. that's difficult for people to admit to, because I can tell you that I've lost, I haven't lost friendships 
but I've lost subscribers and I've mm-hmm. interrupted friendships where I had to actually right. call them back, get on a Zoom sometimes and talk them through because they thought, I thought you were different and I didn't mm-hmm. know you were racist. I don't know if we can be friends anymore. And I was like, oh, come on. You're really calling mm-hmm. me a racist mm-hmm. because I disagree with this. But that's where that, that ideological, I think, the elephant that we talked about with Jonathan Haidt, the elephant is in the room. <laughs> right? right? It's powerful and it's part of most of these discussions specific to identity politics because there are, Sam Harris interviewed um, uh, a PhD in neuroscience who actually changed his spots based on analyses over a period of years. Hmm. And he was no longer liberal or he was no longer conservative. That's what it was. Well, I can't even remember. Okay. What yeah. But he switched. And after he switched, he lost his marriage. He lost his circle of friends. He was mm-hmm. asked to leave his job. And it was one of those things where that's a real reality mm-hmm. in our public today. Like if you don't agree with certain things, you can lose your job and you can lose friends. And that's painful, right? To lose all of your, the mores that we've talked about. It's just that you're, you're not, you're not settled in anything anymore. Everything is loose and you've lost right. your way. And that's, that's right. terrifying for a lot of people. I mean, tribalism isn't powerful because it's, you know, it's supposed to be, it's part of our evolution. You know, no <laughs> one wants to be kicked out of the tribe, you know? I mean, ask a yeah. bull elephant <laughs> right. how that works, right? <clears throat> yeah, I, uh, sorry, so, go ahead. No, I just, so that you, you mentioned you wanted to get back to that. That's kind of why yeah. I shifted. That's what happened to me. Yeah, it's, well, it's, it's fascinating. Um, I, there's, I talk about these sort of dual responsibilities of citizenship and in part, which is what we've been focusing on up to this point is sort of the the cognitive responsibilities of citizenship, which is you really should listen to arguments on both sides. You really should try to objectively evaluate that evidence and uh, go through a bunch of different examples of how to do that and how, how oftentimes we don't do that, but there's a whole other part to this, which, I call it kind of clunky, but I call it the psychosocial uh, responsibilities of citizenship. And that's sort of what you were talking about. And so, you know, there are examples of, you know, take a a conservative person who maybe all of their friends or family are talking about that climate change isn't real or we shouldn't really be concerned about it. And then they, for whatever reason, sort of look into it and they, they find out that in their estimation, you know, hey, the the best evidence is actually that this is real and it's and it's caused by humans and these effects are are real. They've done the cognitive work there, but it's a whole other thing, and and I and I think it's more difficult to do the the psychosocial thing, yeah. and that that is sort of address the cognitive dissonance in yourself that that's going to arise from that when you start exploring these issues. And, you know, it, it can be a slow process. It could, it's sort of a painful process because at first you're going to kind of be in denial. And, uh, but, you know, if you sort of just have that nagging little thing in the back of your head and you sort of keep digging into it and digging into it and eventually, you know, you sort of switch. Uh, but then do you tell your friends? Do you tell your family? Because it, it can, you can be isolated. You know, you, there's only one thing in, you know, in a tribal sort of mentality that's worse than the out group and that that's a traitor, uh, in, in, within the in group. And, uh, and unfortunately there's a lot of stories about that, about broken friendships and broken relationships and, and it can be hard. Uh, and I think we just need, you know, a, a little bit more understanding and it's hard when things are so toxic because everything everything feels so serious and existential um that we can't feel as though we can even have these conversations or even give a little bit because we we fear as though it's that sort of giving into the other side or um and it makes it really hard and that's why i think you were talking about conversations when you listen to a really nice debate between people on different sides, but they're having a, you know, they're doing so in good faith. 
it's it's really liberating and exciting in a way where you can say oh, that, that is a really good point oh well that's a really good point and then you sort of end up in the debate and you're like i don't know what to think about this issue anymore <laughs> uh and but that's not that doesn't make everybody comfortable and a lot of there there is that you know we call it cognitive dissonance for a reason we don't like that feeling uh and we don't and we're afraid that if we sort of give into that, not only will we lose our community, but sort of the whole edifice of what we've built our worldview on is going to collapse. And that's one of the reasons, you know, going back to Hiram Lewis again in his book is, you know, he, he sort of said, go, just go granular, you know, instead of yeah. having, I am a liberal or I am a conservative. And there's this thing that ties all these issue positions together. Well, then if you're wrong about one, and that's your point of view, then you have to be wrong about all of them. But if we just go on an issue by issue basis, right? And, you know, and, and you change your mind on one issue, you change your mind on one issue. And it's not the hundred other issues that, that you have an opinion on it. It, it just, it seems less existential, as I said before. And, and we just have to, I think, get to that point in living in a tribalized society as we do that. It just makes it really hard to do that. This is the end of part one with my chat with Tim Redman. Part two will be published one week from this publication date.